As occupation ends, those who survived Saddam's Republic of Fear remain tortured souls. Some Iraqis, like the writer Kanan Makia, think the symbols of Saddam's repression should be turned into memorials, lest his compatriots forget what he did. But the humiliating experience of one year's occupation has, even in the minds of Saddam's victims, already eclipsed three decades of brutality. Many Iraqis feel betrayed by their liberators. The recovering patient kicked in the teeth. Quite a legacy, really, for Iraq's soon-to-be sovereign government to inherit. Saddam's fists still clench the cross swords that arch over his now empty parade ground in western Baghdad. A vast, vulgar metaphor for his violence and cruelty. And I'm about now, coming back to Iraq, here down the line, about to drive under the swords which huge military machines passed under while he stood there on that throne in the distance. Part of what Saddam conceived himself as he looked at this, he wanted people to feel this palpable sense of this literal sense of the violence. Cruelty became the norm. The standard became torture, not the exception. An exile for 35 years, Canon Makia now dreams of building museums and halls of remembrance here. Makia's Memory Foundation has the support of the US Defense Department, and his effort to secure its financial support has led some to suspect that the project was US inspired all along. He says he's doing it for Iraq and Iraqis. The point of a place like this is to have speech to discover ways of speaking about what happened and in so doing of communicating of putting other human beings who have not suffered this pain in touch as close as a human is possible the purpose of such a place is to bring the whole people of iraq closer and closer to what pain and suffering was like sabah hamoud personifies the agonies of life under saddam the suffering Canon Makia wants Iraqis to remember. An army deserter, Sabah was branded with the mark of a traitor. Half his right ear was hacked off. Sabah didn't languish in jail, though. Saddam Hussein liked other Iraqis to witness the fate of those who dared disobey. <laughs> When I saw people staring at my ear, I wanted to kill them. And on the bus, I sat at the back so people couldn't see my ear. When the Ba'athists arrested me, they told me, you're a traitor and a coward, and chopping your ear off is the least that should happen to you. We should chop off your head. Canon Makia's got six million pages of copious notes kept by Saddam's henchmen on people like Sabah. The last batch of documents Makia discovered, with the help of the US Army, had been hidden in the bowels of a Ba'athist mausoleum. The Ba'ath party had a special unit that collected rumors. Um, informers would send reports from coffee shops and uh, meeting places of one kind or another. Many of these rumors are generated by the regime itself. They make the rumors and then they collect them and then they check how they are reported. Some half of the rumors, of course, are generated by the population itself and half are coming from the regime. So you have a, a very complex record here in seven years of the national psychology of a population under dictatorship. Makia is convinced that if Iraqi people could only look their recent history in the eye, society could begin the process of recovery. But museums and memorials are not a spending priority now. There's not much money on offer to survivors either. 
Saba has joined an informal group of two and a half thousand people who lost parts of their bodies to Saddam's surgeons. They meet in an abandoned building and tell each other the stories Makia thinks all Iraqis should hear. They arrested me and they locked me up in the military intelligence prison because of my political beliefs and religious activism. I was sentenced to 19 years in jail. I was then tortured for seven years. Tell them, tell them what happened, don't worry about it. They cut off one, one of my testicles. The other, well, you know, my manhood's been damaged. Saddam understood very well the subtleties of his people's deeply religious traditions. His torturers were systematic and calculating in their infliction of both sexual and social humiliation. These men exchanged dollars for dinars in a Baghdad market. Canon Makia's archivists unearthed this video, filmed by one of the torturers. This is the first time it's been broadcast. Mustafa Kazemi is in charge of the audiovisual archives. I see this is hand. They shot his hand. And after one day, he discovered they cut his hand. Saddam's surgeons were forced to do this. Canon Makia would love the world to see the unexpurgated version of these chilling images, but they're far too gruesome to broadcast. The footage shows scalpels slicing through people's wrists. It's slow, surgical, and deliberate. In each case, the hand is severed, placed on a green cloth, and filmed. Muslims use their right hands for eating, not to do so is considered unclean. These men's shame is complete. For good measure, this money changers had his forehead tattooed as well. Saddam created a society in which extreme violence became the norm. He brutalized the nation and tormented two generations of Iraqis. Canon Makia thinks the punishment of perpetrators will help lay the ghosts of the past to rest. But that, he says, will be just the beginning. Can we indict the system through these individuals? That's the more important question. That's the, that is the kind of imaginative uh, indictments that lawyers now, Iraqi lawyers and, and international lawyers, need to draw up when people like Saddam Hussein and his cohorts are brought to trial in six, seven months from now. For many Iraqis, the prospect of holding Saddam's regime to account was one good reason for welcoming their liberators. I was very happy when the Americans came to Iraq, and I would like to thank the US for getting rid of Saddam, and I would like to personally thank President Bush for ridding us of that infidel criminal. But the cruelest twist was to come within months of Saddam's downfall. Many Iraqis had thought the nightmare was over but it wasn't. What happened in Abu Ghraib really disturbed us. Now, when I see an American on the street, I want to drink his blood. I spent three months in prison. They released me only three days ago. I can't forget the tortures, like when they poured cold water on me and then put me in front of an air conditioner. I also witnessed many rape cases. I'm one of the Iraqis who will fight the Americans when I go back to my hometown. I will join the resistance. Many other Iraqis we spoke to said they supported the resistance because of the humiliation suffered at the hands of the occupiers. Violence directed at the perpetrators becomes a cleansing force, restoring self-respect and human dignity. These are members of the Al-Fatlawi clan a prominent Shia Muslim family, many of whom were jailed by Saddam. An informer from a rival tribe tipped off the Americans that they were planning an attack on coalition forces. The house was raided and nine were arrested. 
We had suffered for such a long time under Saddam Hussein, but we were surprised by the Americans' disrespect for human rights and democracy. The situation now is worse than the time of Saddam's regime. If I hadn't been imprisoned and seen things with my own eyes, I wouldn't believe the Americans were capable of such atrocities. Under Saddam, Iraqis wouldn't have dared to complain. But the perception is that Iraq's foreign occupiers are just as cruel and calculating and systematic as Saddam, and not at all naive about the subtleties of Iraq's religious traditions. Humiliation that hurts requires an understanding of the culture. I heard the call to prayer, so I washed and started to pray. As I did so, an American came and put his boot on my head. I said, God is great. He kicked me. Then, when I said there is no God but Allah, he started beating me. Sometimes they put shit on your beard and moustache and tear your clothes off. They pour dirty water on you or they beat you with electrical cable. Once they killed a prisoner by torturing him. Then they threatened us and said that if we informed the Red Cross or any other organization, they'd kill all of us. We've been unable to corroborate this story. The U.S. authorities in Baghdad refused to comment on these specific allegations. And it seems there weren't any small digital cameras snapping pictures in Najaf jail, as there were in Abu Ghraib. Whatever the truth, though, such stories aren't uncommon in Iraq. The continuing human rights abuse in Iraq is making Canon Makia's Iraq Memory Foundation look a bit of a sideshow. On top of all that, the violent reality of post-Saddam Iraq is beginning to hit where it hurts. Our dream is that ordinary citizens of Iraq would be using this interface. Er, Rasul? While we're talking to him, one of Makia's employees reports that his home has been hit by a rocket. He's got to go. He asked us not to show his face. Makia can't even afford to pay his staff anymore. The funding promised by the U.S. Defense Department has yet to materialize. It seems his whole world is crumbling. Sometimes I think awful thoughts. Anger over the behavior of occupation forces is so intense that few Iraqis care to remember how bad it all was before. Yet unless Iraqis do confront their past, Violence will continue to be thought of as normal, and the cycle won't be broken. Today, Sabah's mutilated ear is a badge of honor, the sign of a traitor transformed into the mark of a man who was brave enough to resist. Iraq's new sovereign government will now have to fight for the hearts and minds of men like Sabah, to stop them losing faith in the big democracy project.